Hello and welcome to the Flucoma podcast. Today I'm talking with Balint Lexo, who is a composer and sound designer from Norway. So as well as being a talented composer, uh, Balint is also a creative programmer who works with Max, JavaScript and Python. He puts his programming experience to work to create experimental, immersive multi-channel pieces, uh, the latest of which made use of some of the Flucoma tools. Indeed, Balint knows the tools well. He participated in a Flucoma workshop at NOTAM in Oslo and is also active on the Flucoma forum. So today we shall be learning more about his practice and about his piece, The Hum, which comes at the culmination of two and a half years of studies at the Norwegian Academ uh, Academy of Music. So Valent, hello, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. So um, perhaps before we hear more about the piece, um, I'd love to learn a bit more about you and your practice. Uh, so perhaps you could begin by telling me um, about how you got into music and music technology. Okay, uh, that story is a little bit weird because I have been studying uh, classical composition um, at the Music Academy, uh, List Academy of Music in Budapest. And, um, I think uh, around my second year, I have been hanging out a lot with a friend of mine who was not a musician at all, but a hobby guitarist, hobby Abletonist. Um, so he was the, and, and we were talking a lot about uh, music, you know, like uh, as uh, passionate amateurs do. And um, at some point he just showed me Ableton. I think it was something like I asked uh, his help to, uh, polish something in a in a recording I made of my one of my acoustic pieces of course with like a not so great handy recorder uh, from a not so great angle what did I know and then he just loaded up Ableton and like uh, you know uh, started using equalizer and like glue compressor and this and that that was already like whoa this is like uh, uh, like a black magic and then uh, what was actually the real um, bomb uh, for me is uh, Omnisphere 2. Uh, so Omnisphere is this, um, uh, I don't know if they are still out there. I mean, I guess so. Uh, I haven't looked at them for uh, pretty much uh, 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 since then, but it's this uh, massive uh, contact style library of uh, very, uh, well-polished uh, sound design, uh, well, uh, sound objects, let's say. And uh, uh, some of them were, uh, ext I mean, I mean, it, it is geared towards, I guess, Hollywood uh, um, style or use or culture. Um, and uh, it, it was like a completely new open world for me. So, of course, I, I first uh, started to uh, hear recorded or digital sound as like an experimental expression of uh, sound uh, and uh, sound art. And uh, weirdly enough, that was, uh, that did it for me. That uh, then I like uh, kept going back to him and then we were spending like uh, long evenings tweaking uh, stuff at Ableton. And then I learned to use Ableton myself. And this was kind of joining into um, mandatory course at the academy in my third year. Um, this is something that every classical composition student has to go through. It's like two semesters of introduction to electronic music and um, and whatnot. And um, that that already found me uh, in a state where I was eager to absorb anything uh, related to music technology. Uh, I think I still had a pretty classical mindset, but still I was very open to the, the software and like to, to learn all the um, uh, hidden tricks you can do with Max or then I think we moved on to Pro Tools. I got an introduction into, um, what was it called? Audio Sculpt and uh, some, other um, uh, C sound, I think. Yeah, there, there were like a lot. It, it was like a, a bit of introduction into a lot of different things. Uh, mm. And that was great. 
um and yeah i i think pretty much since then i'm slowly gravitating more and more towards uh electronic music and generally music technology or i should say like uh, working with technology as a, as a creator or as an artist mm-hmm. yeah it's, it's, a, it's interesting so you went from um from starting out with ableton then towards uh the lots of different um, environments that you work in. So you've worked with Max, uh, JavaScript, with Python. Um, I'm interested um, and curious to know about um, uh, when you would t- tend to look towards Max and when you would tend to look towards a text-based language. Um, sort of how and why would you work um, in these different environments? Well, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, well, um... It's hard to uh, really delineate this for me because my uh, text-based um, thinking skills uh, or programming skills got, uh, they were co-evolving with my Max patching skills. So like I was uh, learning Max and using it in my uh, projects. I made more and more like um, partly electronic or fully electronic pieces Um, I started to work with live electronics and uh, I even started fencing making like just you know standalone tools for for just like some very goal-oriented little software or something Uh, of course uh, dealing with uh, audio and all of that always um, happened with Max and uh, um while on the other side, my uh, just general, um, I guess, uh, interest in programming uh, grew from learning Python uh, into learning JavaScript and then learning uh, Python even more. <laughs> and it, it always happened uh, at the same time uh, as I was uh, um, developing with Max. And um, uh, well, um, as you probably know, um, a certain version of JavaScript is embedded in Max as well. So, uh, in fact, that was my uh, pretty much my starter uh, base uh, for learning JavaScript. Um, and uh, it, uh, then I already knew Python, so it was a little bit easier to get into. And also, then I got this uh, rush, uh, which I think uh, everyone who who is an eager Max patcher and learns that embedded JavaScript and starts using it, everyone gets this rush like, oh, now I can do stuff. And uh, you would just want to do everything in JavaScript from then on. And then you go back because you realize that it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit slow and also it's a bit weird and uh, uh, et cetera. I mean, we can get, get into that in detail. But so the, the thing is like fast forward today, I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, data science and deep learning, like big data stuff in, in uh, uh, Python. I, I love to do like interactive uh, user interfaces in the form of uh, web apps with, uh, with uh, JavaScript. Um, with lightweight servers, I'm, I'm not such a um, seasoned server guy, uh, just like uh, mostly web sockets uh, related things, uh, not so much database stuff. Um, and then, of course, everything is all, uh, that is like real time audio related is uh, Max. And um, to ask, to finally answer the question, what what's the, um, or what what is I guess for me the benefit of uh, text based or or spatial based? I I kind of feel like I have these uh, two very distinct uh, qualities of thought: the spatial thought and the linguistic thought. So every time every time I uh, the programming needs some linguistic tricks, um, I feel like. Um, text-based uh, programming languages suit me better. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know, um, I, I guess generally loops are more comfortable in, in text-based languages as well, but that's not the end of the world in Max either. Um, what's more like, uh, for example, function overloading or overriding in a class, uh, overriding a class method, or uh, generally like working with classes, I guess that's a, uh, uh, easier in text-based, uh, shall I say, object-oriented text-based languages. And um, 
Um, I guess uh, recursion is also something that's uh, pretty powerful in text-based languages. Um, but uh, what I really like in uh, working with the uh, spatial environment uh, in Max is that uh, I can prototype things fast and uh, uh, it's great when you need this constant flow to, to oversee the constant flow of information in some way, like a, a stream of um, real-time data coming in and out or, or passing things between objects. Because in text-based languages, that's uh, usually done with like uh, debug protocols or like uh, slapping a print statement uh, after every uh, everything you do, and then trying to read it from like a very one-dimensional console um, where the text appears line by line, line by line. So for those kind of things, I I would much rather uh, have Max where I can actually understand the signal flow in a spatial term. Um, and again, like fast pro prototyping is, I think, what I uh, really like uh, in spatial um, programming. Mm, yeah, no, I think that um, that does resonate a lot with me as well. I think a lot of people, especially, yeah, doing doing things like for loops, and I've certainly don't think I've ever tried to do recursion in Max. Uh, yeah, I've, I, you know, I've done for loops, which can be done, but it's very finicky and very, it's just not very fluid and stuff. But um, yeah, no, I think that resonates with, the, with me quite a lot. And it's, yeah, no, it's interesting, actually. In fact, the, talking about um, how you got introduced to these various aspects of things. So it's it was very similar, actually. Um, my side of things, I had in the, my third year of university, a class on um, music technology where we were learning pure data. Mm. And then, yeah, so sort of learning Max and then discovering JavaScript, that kind of empowering moment when you realize the kind of sort of things you can do and then moving on to Python. So yeah, yeah it's, uh, I, I, I followed quite a similar path. Um, great, so I'd like to get an idea also about um, how you see uh, your compositional work um, existing from more of a, an aesthetic point of view. Um, so how would you describe uh, the kind of sound worlds that you like to inhabit? Um, and are there any uh, recurring themes over the course of your works? Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's uh, um, easier for an external uh, observer to answer that, but uh, I will try. Um, I feel like, uh, the, the recurrent uh, theme of uh, at least my latest compositional thinking is uh, granularity and uh, iterativity, um, if, if that's a word. <laughs> and um, uh, generally like um, large masses of things or uh, the relationship of different groups of things, uh, I guess that's... Uh, uh, that's a recurring theme nowadays. Um, I, I wouldn't be sure that that would describe um, my entire path, but uh, I guess I always liked, like even when I was um, studying, let's say orchestral music, uh, I, I always liked this idea of uh, very uh, wide bandwidth polyphony and uh, very active uh, orchestration um, counterpoint I uh, really loved and um, I guess this this idea of a um, lot of semi-independent participant voices uh, in some kind of scene that that's a recurring theme yeah yeah great um, so to get a real good idea about uh, your kind of uh, sound world um, I think be good to start talking about your piece, The Hum, um, which I will say again to you that I thoroughly enjoyed. I was lucky enough to see um, as kind of early recording uh, performance of it um, and which a trailer is now um, available and which will of course be linked to and shared uh, alongside this video. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a remarkable piece. Um, Perhaps as an introduction to kind of frame things, uh, you could tell me more about the hum, um, which is a phenomenon that I was unaware of until I looked it up on Wikipedia and then uh, got quite scared. <laughs> Are you referring to the Windsor hum? 
So I saw the Windsor hum. I saw there. I saw there were several hums. There were di different types of hums. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so the I think this is the funniest um, <laughs> uh, thing because um, I came up with the concept and the story of uh, of the hum in uh, one of those very um, like momentary uh, periods of enlightenment or like when you when you suddenly have this uh, divine inspiration moment, um, which I'm not really a believer of, but um, um uh, it, it, it happened that way and uh you know i, I wrote down this uh, story that uh, that is uh, sort of introduction of the light live performance and then uh, i sketched up the sort of visual language uh, or structure of uh, how it will work and then i started implementing it and uh, i then i had a class with my then mentor pierre alexander trombley uh and um he was asking me like, are you referring to the Windsor hum? And I was like, um, no, um, it was just um, uh, my uh, idea. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess the, the biggest inspiration of, the, of my hum uh, is the hiss from the game Control, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with that. I'm not, no. Uh, it's like a, a recent video game. Uh, mm -hmm that is uh, situated in this uh, sort of semi-hidden um, federal bureau of control uh, in uh, i guess the usa uh, although it's not explicitly said um, and uh, there is this uh, mysterious corrupting force uh, there uh, the hiss uh, that is sort of like a resonance and it sort of takes uh, uh, control of um, people and things. And uh, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I have to say, I'm not uh, very knowledgeable and also not like a very uh, uh, seasoned gamer. Um, I, I uh, was recommended to uh, try out this game uh, by my brother. Uh, and uh, I, I was absolutely amazed, uh, especially by the lore, the story uh, that, uh, that unfolds. And uh, I think uh, when I started to working on the hum, I was still under, this, uh, under the influence of this uh, fantastic, uh, beautiful uh, story uh, they put together. Uh, and um, I guess my hum is, is most inspired by, by the hiss in, in the control. Um, partly, uh, this, this also um, uh, surfaces in, uh, in, an, uh, in a deliberate reference uh, to the hiss because uh, the color, uh, the, the language of the hiss, the visual language of the hiss always used the color red. Uh, so what mm. you see in the the end of my performance, where like the red world uh, sets in, uh, that's in a way a conscious reference to the his. Uh, but um, I guess that was only important for me. I'm I'm not really. I don't feel that's important. Uh, that uh, I don't know uh, people who observe or perceive the piece uh, notice. Uh, mm. But it's certainly not uh, um, in connection with uh, all those various uh, hum uh, contails that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I the uh, actually it was striking for me how many I uh, discovered. I mean there were like two or three or maybe four different uh, uh, hum theories. And I started to feel maybe this is like an archetypical, you know, uh, not fear, but like some kind of um, um, uh, inner thought of humanity that there is some kind of hum. In which uh, case, it would be really funny that I actually made a piece and a short story out of it. Um, yeah, and in a way, it fits in actually. Um, so I I don't mind uh, that uh, that that coincidence happened. But uh, yeah, it, it is actually a funny coincidence. Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a really intriguing idea and one that does tap into, you know, those kinds of ingrained fears that we may have within us that we might not necessarily be conscious of. But it's uh, the kind of uneasiness that that kind of idea can install. In. And I think it's yeah, it's a it's a really um, rich topic for sound 
composition um, as, yeah. as, as we've seen. Uh, yeah, no, that's great. Um, so for those, for, so for the people who won't have heard or seen the piece yet, um, perhaps uh, you could just describe it to us. So what kind of things do we see, uh, see what kind of things do we hear? Um, and maybe begin to sort of talk about how this is relating to your, to your idea of the hum. Okay, uh, so um, the hum is a, a 3D audiovisual live performance with uh, currently one frontal huge projector. Uh, and uh, I guess as many speakers as uh, possible at the venue because it's, uh, it's using ambisonics. Uh, in the premiere, it was, I think, um, a 16 channel ring with four subs. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm obviously like uh, in the front of the audience. And uh, so the piece starts with this, uh, 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 basically the, the entire short story uh, being read out uh, by a friend of mine. And the uh, short story is basically uh, telling us like uh, what our uh, theories about the uh, hum are and then what it does to people like signs of the presence of the hum and then there uh, in the end of the story uh, I mentioned that um, uh, until about two years ago the hum was relatively absent from public discussion but then uh, there appeared a reddit thread that claimed that there were instructions to um, create devices that can tune into the hum and interact with it. And then uh, that kind of, uh, uh, that has a lot of Easter eggs about the composition uh, later, but also uh, leads into me uh, sitting in front of the audience with my laptop, um, sort of hinting that I'm one of those guys who uh, created this uh, either hardware or software or something that can tune into the hum so that we can now kind of take a safari ride and uh, enjoy uh, or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, uh, in, um, so when the text is done, then sort of the curtains rise and uh, we found ourselves in, the, in this dark uh, 3D scene where uh, we see a lot of um, uh, lobes or, or uh, spheres. Uh, connected with poles. And it has this very particular weird shape, which we can, I guess, uh, talk about in specifics later, how, how that shape is done. Um, and uh, all of the spheres uh, correspond to a sound action or, or sound gesture uh, in a library of around 5,000 sounds now. Uh, all of these sounds uh, were recorded, uh, or shall I say, performed by me. And um, um, well, I guess we can get into the technicalities later, but in terms of what you see as an audience, you just see uh, us uh, uh, hovering uh, increasingly into the midst uh, of this uh, grid or, or network of uh, nodes. And then it gets more and more active. So first you just see uh, single nodes lighting up in, in red um, and then uh, emitting some kind of sound gesture. And then uh, as we go on, uh, this scene gets more and more intense. Uh, it envelops us. Uh, I uh, created the visuals so that like every time you see something in one particular direction, the 3D sound corresponds to that direction. Uh, so in a way, uh, the, the camera and the uh, uh, speaker system are locked together. You always see what you hear, or hopefully that's the case. And uh, later on, as things get more uh, intense, uh, there are um, newer and newer forms of expression that uh, we see happening. We see uh, the poles uh, sort of uh, lighting up between the nodes uh, as like a metaphorical uh, chain lightning. We hear like uh, we, we see and hear this swarm of nodes uh, lighting up in a particular uh, uh, 
pattern that uh, to me resembles wind. Um, and um, uh, there, are, there are also this rhythmical uh, and tonal uh, patterns uh, with, with like a, isolated groups of notes that uh, was an allegory of rain uh, for me. Uh, so um, for, a, for a long while, this is um, what uh, is developing in the, in the scene as we go deeper and deeper. And then we start to uh, see more and more of these um, uh, white flashes uh, as if like the entire world would uh, invert in color uh, almost and uh, after a while um, we actually find ourselves suddenly sort of swapped into this uh, white, wor white world where a new kind of um, uh, atmospheric sound uh, begins to develop um, we can talk about that later too how that was made and then uh, eventually uh, this white world also uh, breaks down and uh, the red world takes over in the ending sequence in the finale where we see uh, the entire world in red and the uh, and a huge uh, sort of um, uh, spider spider web uh, taking up the middle of the screen and uh, with fast camera movements sort of um, swiping through the the entire uh, structure of these nodes and uh, uh, it, it uh, develops into this huge uh, thunder of, uh, of uh, many many sounds and uh, we start to lose maybe the um, the individual individual shapes of these gestures and just perceive them as this uh, thick continuous stream of uh, sound morphing from one shape or one spectrum into another uh, and then the entire uh, scene uh, visually decomposes and falls apart in uh, some kind of combination which was my hint that uh, the hunt the hum sort of uh, um, became aware that we were there and doing this. And just uh, as I hint in the story, uh, screens and uh, electronic devices tend to break down after, after a while in the presence of the home. So that's what happens in the end that uh, our uh, device, uh, our connection gets hijacked by the home and eventually our uh, devices die. Mm. That's the yeah. end of our ride. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's really remarkable. And yeah, talking about that that final part where where things suddenly kind of slide into this massive ending um, sequence that was you know kind of awesome enough to see on YouTube, but um, I can't imagine also how that must have been um, in a live space as well. It must have been really remarkable. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I'd, I'm really curious to hear about um, how this is working under the hood. So obviously there's several aspects to this. Um, I think a good place to start is probably um, with this structure, which is, um, you know, this web of, of, of spheres and, and poles that you were describing. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, there's some kind of feature extraction happening on the sounds there's some kind of dimensionality reduction happening uh, maybe you could take us through what what's happening with uh, how, how that that uh, web which seems to constitute quite an important part of the things that we're hearing and seeing um, how that was built and and how you implement that yeah uh, so this is where I should uh, start with uh, the fact that uh, uh, Although the final artistic concept uh, came relatively late, there was a lot. There, uh, there were a lot of uh, forms or iterations of this piece uh, half finished, and it was not uh, also obvious from the start that it's going to be an audio visual piece. Um, and the entire, like all all these different iterations, were very much inspired by my increasing. Um, 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 getting in, me increasingly getting into the Fukuma tools. And uh, as you uh, 
very well guessed um, uh, the this uh, this sort of uh, grid of uh, spheres or this uh, spider web of uh, spheres is uh, exactly done as you described so i had uh, i designed a uh, uh, feature set uh, of uh, of the sounds. Um, uh, this was uh, very good. Uh, I mean, um, so it was it was uh, good. Uh, I designed these uh, features or handcrafted these features with a good feeling because I went through the uh, labor of uh, recording and uh, manually slicing every single uh, sound gesture in this. Uh, I guess I should start there. So um, at the beginning of my Fukoma discoveries, I, I was into slicing. So I was very, uh, I, I felt very liberated that I can finally do granular synthesis that uses the internal grains of the sounds themselves uh, mm -hmm. instead of uh, arbitrary windows of uh, sounds. Mm -hmm. It felt much more physical, much more natural. Um, so I started with that and I, I got into slicing uh, first. Um, and then I uh, realized that um, the automatic slicing tools are very good for a lot of things, uh, but uh, through using uh, them and failing at them, failing at using them well, I realized uh, what I want actually, <laughs> which was to have this um, very uh, self-contained um, uh, sound gesture. So like uh, um, a little sound event that has like a beginning, a middle and an end, uh, but like from half a second to three seconds. Um, uh, or, or even it, it could be later I extended the data set with just like individual impulses. Uh, um, and so for these, it was very hard to design a robust slicer um, because it basically had to guess what I want, <laughs> which is uh, not easy. Um, and even I was not uh, always consistent with my decisions. So it was kind of a mess and uh, totally impossible to create an automatic slicer for this. So what I did was uh, to uh, curate uh, each and every slice manually and also like uh, um, assign fades to them. I was uh, using Reaper for all this, of course, uh, the, the mighty dynamic split uh, function, which is kind of the similar as the AMP gate uh, in Flucoma, uh, but with a nice visual interface. Um, and uh, so when, when I had this uh, huge amount of, or uh, growing amount of uh, manually sliced sounds, uh, I started thinking about uh, what kind of um, descriptors should I choose for those. And I started, of course, with very generic ones like uh, spectral shape and MFCCs. And then uh, PA uh, brought it to my attention, this idea that I should handcraft the features to tailor to to fit the data set that i have not just I, I shouldn't try to just make a generally good descriptor set i should choose the descriptor set to fit my particular sound data set and i was actually very particular with the sounds and uh, gestures i chose so uh, as as it's also hinted in the story um um, people who get sort of uh, possessed by, by the hum start to uh, scratch surfaces and rob objects and, um, and eventually they only just uh, uh, end up humming a tone. Um, so um, there are mostly uh, scratching and rubbing uh, and uh, um, different gestures of, of uh, different variations of uh, this idea in the data sets. So it's uh, not so tonal, actually, as you probably also heard in the piece, there is very little tonal content in it. Um, uh, in fact, I felt like uh, later that I should uh, counterbalance the enormous noisiness of the piece. Uh, and that's when I uh, created the RAIN module which is like one of the expressions of, that the hum uses. And it's uh, 
very heavily based on uh, sharp uh, peak filters. So in a way, it creates these uh, tones out of uh, this, this fake tones out of the completely flat, noisy surface. Um, yeah, so uh, I started to, uh, uh, I, I had this, um, um, so when I started handcrafting the features as PA suggested, I realized that since I recorded everything uh, by hand and sliced everything by hand, I had a pretty good mental representation of what kind of sounds and gestures I have. Mm. So uh, then I um, devised this uh, set of descriptors uh, and also shared it on the Flukoma forum. I later realized that uh, uh, PA and some other people referred refer to that as the Balin descriptors. Um, and that's, uh, so if you go to the Flukoma forum and uh, search for Balin descriptors, uh, <laughs> it's exactly those, I think. I, I didn't really extend them. So uh, I guess the uh, more interesting part of these descriptors is that uh, it used uh, time, the length of the sound, or like um, volume balance between like the start of the sound and the rest of the sound. But I guess the, for me, the most interesting part is that I used slicers as descriptors. So uh, I used, uh, I think, the amp slice, the transient slice, uh, mm. novelty slice too, I think. So I, I uh, established this idea of like um, uh, grain rates or, or density mm -hmm. uh, in the sound. And that was actually... That was working pretty well. Uh, like it, it beautifully separated uh, very buzzy or rolling or iterative sounds from from more smooth uh, uh, ones. Mm -hmm. And so uh, after uh, this, I think uh, four sixty uh, dimensional feature space uh, comes. stayed. Yeah, it stayed quite high dimensional. The the feature space that you then put into dimensionality reduction. Yes, and, and then I robust scaled it and put it through uh, UMAP. And uh, I, I really enjoyed working with the UMAP object in, uh, in the Flukoma tools uh, because it, uh, I, I, I really feel like there was a um, thought. Uh, so uh, the developers of it spent uh, enough thought that it's, uh, an in, it became an intuitive tool for uh, creators, because I, um, in the end, I uh, bounced down my uh, sixty something dimensional data set into three dimensions, and that gave the positions of the spheres. Uh, but I still had a lot of leeway in uh, tweaking the, the variables of UMAP, the, the neighbor distance and the global uh, distance, etc. Iterations. Um, so that I arrived to this um, to this particular shape that I that I really liked. Mm. Also, it was interesting that uh, um, I could um, experience this data set evolving in time. So, in a way, um, uh, as it got more and more robust, uh, adding individual sounds didn't uh, you know tilt the balance of the entire thing so much anymore. And it was beautiful to see that the UMAP didn't really give me, uh, you know, completely different or organizations of things. It was more and more freezing into this one particular position, but extended it, uh, in extending it with uh, different branches or, or swelling areas or etc. As I obviously I did more and more sounds to particular groups, and and uh, this was also a very good uh, way for me to get an idea of what, uh, what sounds do I need uh, more if I want mm. to add something to this uh, set of 5,000 sounds. Like, uh, what are the areas? I can very easily see on, like, a development version of the patch where I also um, uh, treat the visuals as sort of a 3D plot. Mm -hmm. there, there I can very easily see, OK, I have a lot of sounds in this direction. And it very nicely uh, forms a bridge to this area, but then there is this isolated uh, island here. 
-hmm. So either there are too many sounds there, or the, you know, I should uh, bridge the gap with some uh, sounds in between. And uh, so then I, uh, as I added more and more sounds informed by the UMAP representation, I often did this uh, sampling exercise in the recording booth that uh, I create a sound, uh, a sound gesture uh, that I'm more or less familiar with that kind of belongs to some, uh, some space. And I um, iteratively, very, very slowly repeat it uh, uh, with tiny variations until it uh, goes completely to a, to a sound B, to a completely different sound. So I intentionally create this, uh, tiny performances that uh, gradually morph into sound B from sound. Mm. And uh, that also worked very well in the spatial yeah. presentation. That's, that's really interesting to hear how kind of that, that space of the collection of sounds that you're building up is participating in the recording of new sounds to, to build up that space as well. And uh, I suppose one, one thing that comes to mind is uh, the, the what would you think of perhaps maybe um, programmatically automating that process with something like audio transport um, that would perhaps synthesize new sounds? And that, that's just something that occurs to me. So something that could be, but obviously very different from, you know, um, experiencing and 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 getting to know this space and then physically going into the recording booth and and re and recording the sounds. But yeah, no, it's it's really really interesting. Um, and yeah, so to, and so obviously talking about segmentation, which is um, which is still really difficult, um, especially depending on what we want to do. You talk about um, the spheres and the sounds, rather than just being sounds. You talk of them as being sound gestures or sound actions. And mm. so yeah, that's that that makes it a lot more complicated to to split things up. Um, but yeah, no, it's really interesting also to hear about the balance descriptors and, and how you're, it does seem that you're wanting to get a sense of gesture and, and how things are morphing over time, which, you know, I, I, you can begin to do with, uh, you know, like uh, collections of spectral shape descriptors and certain configurations and stuff. But yeah, no, it's, it's really, it's really interesting to hear um, attacking a corpus in that way um, and uh, really, really thinking about uh, the way that they're being described and, and trying to get a sense for these kind of gestures and stuff. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting to hear about. Um, so another big uh, technical side of the piece um, is, uh, is going to be navigating and engaging with this artifact that's created. Um, so there are several things here. So first of all, one thing that strikes me um, is that uh, the whole piece is, is quite cinematic in nature and, and, and you've got a trailer for the piece coming out, you know, and it's, it's, it's all very um, story driven and, and, uh, and, uh, and also um, the camera, which is moving through this space also it seems to be playing quite an important role. There's obviously thought that's gone into where we are, what we're allowed to see. This uh, changes um, across the piece. At, at first, it seems like it seems like us that are moving through the piece, um, but then when we get into the red world, it, it, it almost seems like the world is moving us. You know, it's kind of, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear um, sort of technically how how moving through the space works, how um, how choosing different sounds to be played back um, works, um, how gesturally and uh, in performance you're engaging with uh, with this structure and the space that you've created. Yeah, uh, so the the entirety of this uh, 3D world is uh, built by uh, Jitter. So in fact, the entire of the real-time uh, instrument is a set of uh, max patches and pretty much nothing else. Um, so uh, as, you, as you pointed out, the, the camera is one of the main instruments of mine. And I have two set of controls for it. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, doing it, by the way, everything on my computer keyboard. 
uh, I found that uh, since I have to do a ton of different uh, uh, things, uh, launch different uh, events, uh, expressions or chain uh, particular things into each other, or like trigger like global changes or camera speed changes or etc. There, there are I think over forty shortcuts uh, that I use. Uh, I, I uh, collected them all for my, uh, you know, master's report when I uh, finished the university, and I was surprised uh, that it's actually quite a lot. And every time I have a few weeks or months break. Uh, on, and then I get back to the piece to practice it. The first thing, uh, the first uh, evening goes pretty much just uh, into relearning the keyboard shortcuts. Uh, so the the navigation is uh, two uh, two times four keys. Uh, the WASD for uh, moving forward, back, uh, strafing left and right. Um, and then, so that's about moving. And then the right hand is about turning. Uh, that's the I, K, J, L uh, set of keys. So I have this like uh, symmetrical uh, four keys for both hands. And then the I turns up, pitches up, uh, the K pitches down, the J turns left, the L turns right. And there is no role in this uh, implementation. Um, and that's, uh, that's already actually something challenging to to work with. Um, I was thinking about using a mouse, but the problem is that um, uh, I found that moving with the mouse is way more hectic. Uh, it's more efficient in a way that like if you want to turn uh, into a specific direction, uh, since I uh, grew up with uh, using mouse uh, uh, since I was like uh, six or seven, uh, I have a pretty good muscle memory of or like a proprioceptive understanding of what to do with the mouse. Uh, so that would have been much easier, but uh, I wouldn't be able to do it so smoothly in a way, or I thought so at least back then. So that's why, I, uh, and also I felt that in order to be able to fastly trigger all these uh, different actions, I need both of my hands uh, on deck uh, constantly. So I don't have time to actually move my hands uh, uh, to the mouse and then back to the keyboard. So this is uh, this is how that's happening. And then, um, in terms of like choosing the uh, the sounds, obviously when when I have just a computer keyboard. I have a limited set of choices of what I can do. It's pretty much uh, launching things most of the time. So I guess the, the continuous controls I have are the camera controls uh, in, in the form of like uh, uh, pressing down a key and then pressing it until I uh, turn or move enough to the direction I want. All the other uh, keys are uh, momentary triggers. And uh, uh, this, this was a challenge, uh, but I tried to uh, counterbalance it with the fact that, as I said, most uh, or like all of the sounds in this uh, data set of 5,000 are uh, individual gestures on their own. So the, the dynamism is in the sound files or the sound gestures. So I don't really have to rearticulate them um, mm -hmm. in uh, in the performance. So when it comes to the first uh, basic uh, expression of the hum, what I call candles for some reason, uh, where individual um, nodes light up and play a sound. Um, there I have uh, two, uh, two uh, keys one that will trigger something far and another that will trigger something close. And uh, both of them have weights uh, to, uh, to support more things happening in front of the camera rather than everywhere. Uh, that was something I realized midway in the development that uh, if I just uh, ask for a completely random uh, choice from the data sets, uh, 
it could be very nice in terms of like a spatial sound experience, but after a while, uh, it, uh, it grows on you that uh, there is so much activity that you don't really see, especially if you, mm -hmm. you know, in the beginning of the piece learns this uh, visual or uh, oral coupling of like something happening there, something happening there. Uh, and then uh, where there are increasing uh, activity and uh, of course, um, by chance, most of it will lie outside of your vision since your, your camera is only, I think it's like a 45 uh, uh, degree lens uh, camera. And so like, statistically speaking, you, you have a much bigger chance of firing something that outside of uh, view. And uh, I had to counterbalance that. So I, I'm constantly mm. uh, casting a ray in front of my, in, in front of the camera direction and uh, uh, choosing sometimes the sound uh, uh, anywhere, basically. Uh, but mostly in this, like, I think 45 or 60 degree uh, angle in front of me in both uh, laterally and uh, horizontally and vertically. Um, the same goes, I think, for every even, every other event. So this this was like a big uh, learning experience uh, for me that I, I need to design things to happen in front of us, uh, not just anywhere. Um, then uh, I guess the the second module uh, is the uh, lightning or chain lightning module. Where, uh, where I actually used recursion in Max <laughs> in the form of uh, um, nested polys with loopback connections. Um, but um, I, I'm not sure actually, if, like uh, it's somewhere bet between a while loop and the true recursion. So I wouldn't say it's like as exact recursion as you would do in Python or somewhere else, but um, it's as close as I could get because the um, the lightning nodes when I trigger lightning uh, file, find their uh, consecutive chain chains uh, recursively, so they they find a nearby node uh, where they can jump and therefore the the pole between them can light up. Then that node will again look for um, some potential uh, nodes to hop on. And there is always this like uh, um, X degree of divergence from the direction of the previous vector so that it's not just like some jumbled mess, but it actually has this uh, sort of arc shaped of like a chain mm. line. Um, uh, that, that also just happens pretty much by uh, pressing one button. I have a button for uh, launching a single lightning node or instance. And I have uh, a button to launch all of them at once from one uh, node, uh, like sort of spiraling outwards. Um, and then uh, there is one more uh, node that is uh, controlled uh, quite tightly uh, or shall I say that the next two nodes or the, uh, the next two um, expressions um, are more controlled in a loose way. So the, in, the, in the singular fire, uh, so the, the candle module and the lightning module is always like I push a button, something happens um, in a relatively defined uh, time period. Uh, but then when, when it comes to the rain and the wind modules, those are more fear, free. The wind, I just switch on uh, and off. And then if I switch it on, uh, then this uh, Boyd's algorithm uh, starts to uh, uh, invisibly uh, wander around the space and then sort of exciting nodes uh, around it uh, on its way. Um, the output of this is also heavily uh, um, uh, filtered and uh, distorted to uh, uh, strengthen this allegory of wind. Uh, the same goes for the lightning sounds, by the way. Uh, they are like uh, grossly distorted and uh, overdri overdriven and um, uh, 
um, rectified uh, so that um, they they have this uh, sort of uh, aggressive electric uh, harsh quality. Um, uh, the last module, uh, the the rain is also similar to the wind, uh, but uh, it's a bit more finite. Uh, so the wind can go on forever uh, if I switch it on. The the rain is uh, more like I launch a sequence, and I have another button to stop a sequence if I want like a, a build up, uh, some explosions with the lightning, and then a dramatic silence. Uh, I can quickly switch off everything, uh, the, both the rain or and the wind. Um, and the the rain is typically uh, like a thirty second to sixty second uh, arc of. Uh, something symmetrically building up and then decaying. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much uh, the controls and also, I guess, the descriptions of the modules in some way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's fascinating because there seems to be yeah, a balance and a mix of, of some things which are automated processes that you're going to be um, sort of setting off. For, other things that are very performed and very tied to, to what you're doing as a performer. This, this whole um, kind of question um, of, of these, these spaces that are building up. So, you know, there's, you'll have seen um, across various people who have been using the Flucoma tools. Um, it's implemented in lots of different ways. So a, a lot of People have been doing things with two two dimensional sound maps. You've got Gerard Roma um, in his live coding performance, uh, for example. Um, and then I was talking um, a few episodes ago to um, to Simon Smith, who's the technical engineer at Birmingham's Beast, um, and also a musician in in his own right. And um, he actually cited your. 3D Corpus Explorer um, on the forum is really helping his work and he wanted me to pass on his thanks for that. Okay. Uh, and, um, and yeah, and he, he, uh, he uses uh, EMG bracelets, um, which are measuring muscle activity and, and things like that to, to move around this, this three dimensional space. But uh, yeah, it's something that's, um, that can be looked at in so many ways and that you indeed do seem to to look at in just within the space of this piece in so many different ways um yeah no it's it's really fascinating to hear um and so i suppose hearing about that, that kind of because it sounds like quite a difficult um instrument to play um how um, do you follow a very specific path through 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 the space for each performance? So how how much is improvised? How much? Uh, how how precise is the? Is there a score for the piece? Maybe how 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 precise is that? I'm uh, halfway between uh, free improv and uh, following a score. So there are some broad things that I decided. Uh, for for example, it's. Um, absolutely set in stone that I'm going from the black world to through the white world, uh, arriving to the red world and then ending the particular way I'm ending it. Uh, that's pretty much set in stone. Um, there is also like this um, starting point of the piece uh, that's always the same um, and uh, sort of the path uh, into the forest is uh, pretty similar every time. Um, there are some um, broader uh, arcs that I experiment with, but somewhat interchangeably. Um, I usually uh, do like a, a small, uh, or like a sparse um, exploratory phase in the very beginning, where we mostly are just silently watch and there are like some little sound gestures here and there. Um, and so that's that's something I like to start the piece with. And then uh, eventually that grows into uh, something that introduces the, uh, the individual sounds fire that close and then eventually the lightning and the flickering uh, between white and uh, black. That usually happens as like one big buildup. Um, eventually uh, the way I, so the way I, uh, transition into the white world 
is also somewhat defined. I uh, uh, always arrive uh, to the white world as like a subito pianissimo uh, following this huge uh, fortissimo buildup. Um, it's, it's always like that. Uh, the, how I get there, how I get to that uh, culmination point in the blackboard that sort of uh, swaps over the white world, um, I, that, that's not so defined. I, I don't feel that I found the most optimal way to do that yet. I'm experimented with different routes or, or um, structures, but um, I always like to arrive to the white world as a, as a big uh, uh, tutta forza. Um, and then the white world uh, uh, where the atmospheric uh, diffuse sound space uh, starts to come in. So there is not only silence anymore as like the bed of things, but there is also this uh, growing more and more complex uh, 3D sound world. Um, uh, my my uh, strongest inspiration for the white world was like some kind of liquid glass. Um, and... Uh, I actually, um, so I guess we can talk about that later. How, how that transition, uh, how that uh, inspired the this uh, 3D sound uh, texture. But um, when it comes to like the performance and the visuals, the white world is always uh, uh, pretty much uh, throughout uh, quiet and a bit more frozen, a bit more. Um, in a way distant or uh, abstract uh, world. So I, um, I mostly uh, keep quiet, uh, uh, lis uh, let the audience listen to the newly introduced atmospheric sounds. Um, and then after a long pause, uh, when those sounds start to build up uh, as well, I start to uh, uh, coordinate with them and uh, create a sort of co-build up uh, with them. It's, uh, it, it happens like uh, small but uh, ever growing uh, waves of energy. And then uh, after a while, uh, I um, create this uh, big build up in the white world as well with the introduction of the lightning, which was, uh, which is for like, uh, I don't know, at least 10 minutes uh, absent from the white world. Um, uh, with the introduction of the um, uh, lightning in the white world, uh, we start to have flashes back to the black world that uh, uh, counter to, the, to our expectations won't swap back to the black world, but instead uh, morph into the red world. And one of my newer developments that I like to do this with uh, by sort of driving to the edge of the of the universe a little bit, so there is uh, almost nothing in the camera anymore. And then I create, uh, and I, then I uh, just uh, pitch the camera completely uh, 180 back. Uh, and as we sort of arrive back, uh, uh, you know, uh, the field of uh, the entire universe in our view, uh, getting back into our view, it also morphs into the red world. And, um, and then in the red world, I'm uh, um, introducing this new uh, mode of playing, which is uh, uh, with this uh, ball, of, um, uh, ball of fire or <laughs> a ball of energy, a ball of nodes. Uh, that is more, more or less headlocked uh, to our view. As you said, uh, throughout, uh, it feels like we are moving in a space, but then it feels like the space is moving uh, uh, in front of us. And um, uh, then I'm just, uh, um, after a few momentary um, uh, expressions of, uh, of with this uh, instrument, I'm moving on to uh, gradually exploring and showcasing kind of the entirety of the data set. Um, spending some time at a specific uh, island that I like, which is mostly this very quiet, very uh, spectrally flat, um, almost like the letter F or like a piano 
uh, sounds um, and um, it almost feels like a compressed uh, blob of whispers um, uh, which where I spend some time and uh, finally I tend to end uh, at a certain spot where there are a lot of uh, very harsh percussive-ish uh, iterative buzzing uh, sounds and then I just um, uh, spiral into madness uh, at that point and the piece there. Yeah no it's it is interesting to hear that um, that none of those events like the turning into the red world that that turning of the camera angle and that seems so well synchronized to what we're hearing and stuff that none of it's scripted kind of automated events you you really are controlling all of that and yeah you we, we begin to understand the the time that you must have spent just learning how to navigate through this thing it's uh yeah yeah it's it's really really quite impressive um so i'm interested sort of at this point so the the piece came at the end of uh, was sort of your your final project at the end of these two and a half years of studies and um and uh, I'm interested to hear how you sort of see the piece um, uh, now um, and sort of how, how you would see this living and feeding into your work in, in the future. So both technically, um, what are things that you'd like to develop in this kind of system um, and aesthetically, you know, um, uh, are you pleased with, with how this is sounding? Um, would you envision doing this similar kind of processes with a different completely different kind of data set or or has the data set kind of driven a lot of the development of the tool and and maybe wouldn't make sense um with, with a different type of corpus i'm interested to see how um how you see this this system and this piece uh living at the moment and existing at the moment and how you might see this developing in the future mm -hmm. Well, uh, certain aspects of uh, this system I like very much and I would like to take on developing and refining even further. Um, I think the, the, the fact that I really like about this uh, system is its uh, scalability. So now um, the way the, the things are sort of patched together and built uh, it's uh, relatively easy now if your computer can handle it to add more different uh, hum expressions or modules, uh, like different ways of exciting the data sets. Uh, it's also very easy to scale the data set itself and just pour more uh, sounds into it. Um, and uh, I, I guess yeah, about about the data set, actually, I, I was thinking about this recently, like um, when I uh, started sampling again, um, uh, hopefully arriving some new sounds that I can put into the hum, because originally I, I wanted somewhere along like uh, 20,000 sounds. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's a nice feature of the system that as you put more and more sounds in the universe itself gets bigger and bigger. And more, and there is more and more space to explore. Um, but uh, I found that uh, most of my recent tries, uh, efforts to to record something, it always felt like I'm creating some kind of cliche of something that already exists, uh, some kind of caricature or that already exists in the data set. So I find it very hard now to introduce a sound that is not redundant in some way, but uh, has a meaningful place uh, in the data set. So I might find some new sounds uh, in a bit, but uh, so far it feels actually like a pretty consolidated set, although that was not my plan. Uh, and uh, I will probably not do this uh, or this kind of piece again with just like a different data set, because um, as, as we talked about this earlier, uh, the, so me learning my data set was a very crucial part of developing this piece. And it's in a way the, the DNA of the piece uh, in, in some sense. So I don't think it would work the same way in just, uh, just another data set. But on the other hand, it just, Technically speaking, I really like the idea of um, exploring sound data sets with this interactive three-dimensional um, visual way. Uh, so I, I 
I uh, that's why I shared it on the Flukuma uh, hub as well. I thought people would like that. Um, and then, um, so um, yeah, there, there was another project where I uh, used a very stripped down version of this uh, system with another data set where, where it was also very useful to be able to see the, the relationship between different sounds uh, in a three-dimensional way. Um, so that's, that's also something I would definitely keep using as just an instrument of, as, as just a way of learning my, my sounds, my material. Um, I, I have to say, actually, for me, even though it might be, you know, uh, more complicated to navigate a 3D system than just a 2D plot, I find it way more intuitive for me to explore relationships like that jump from 2D to 3D. It's, it's so meaningful if you, um, if you use dimension reduction. So, um, if you you map the same data set down to two dimensions, a lot of the uh, for me important relationships would get obscured, and uh, some of the Flukoma friends uh, were discussing uh, adding color as one of the dimension uh, dimensions to this, and we we were also chatting about this um, uh, with Rodrigo, I think. Um, and uh, I, I certainly see this as a very uh, useful tool for like, um, I don't know, sonification purposes or, or like more instrumental um, goals. Uh, but um, um, for, for me, it was, uh, uh, at least on my current data set, it, it didn't feel like it really conveys the, the relationship, uh, relationships. So uh, my, my under, when I look at this graph or like this uh, graphical user interface, I, uh, my uh, thinking is so overwhelmed by the spatial thinking that uh, the relationship with the colors uh, gets somehow uh, blocked out. And I kind of perceive that, yes, there is uh, this color there that's also this color there. And if I check, yes, those sounds have some stuff in common. But I don't see like how one color turns into another color in like through a series of uh, samples, uh, which I can very easily perceive in the in the dim uh, in the spatial layout. Mm. So that's, that's why I like the three dimensions better. Um, but uh, honestly, I feel that the two dimensional representation is just uh, much more practical, much more packageable, and um, mm. much easier to demonstrate. So um, um, I, I'm not saying that uh, I or someone else shouldn't use uh, two dimensional representations. I'm just saying, uh, I guess I'm just trying to encourage people to really get into the uh, three dimensional exploration of. Uh, mm. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it is an interesting question because yeah, and so you know the two, the two dimensional and the three dimensional mappings are very different objects, which are going to suggest different ways that people engage with them. But, it, but I think you're right um, that I, I believe that well, I believe, and this is based on kind of just um, intuitive experience with some of the tools that there are only a certain number of dimensions that we can handle as as human beings and especially depending on the context that we're going to be engaging with these objects in if you're doing something in performance uh, if you're doing something for analytical means if you're using an artifact as a as an aid for composition you know we're going to be able to engage with these objects on different time scales um with different um kind of embodied knowledge of the artifact that we're that we're using um, yeah, so it's, 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 I think um, everyone, you know, depending on their practice uh, will, will find their way in that. And there's also, you know, questions about um, the, 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 the um, scale of dimensionality uh, um, that are going to be used to, to, to build up these things. So, 
using something very high dimension like MFCC um, for, for, for using dimensionality reduction in a space, but also, for example, uh, Gerard Roma, he combines that kind of dimensionality reduction technique with using one dimensional data like loudness to, to map to a certain thing on, on, on his nose. You know, it's, there's so many ways that, the, that this can be taken anyway, and that, and you know, each way will be, will be, uh, will be different um, according to people's practice. And I think, you know, obviously the, the great thing about the flute coma tool set is that it is granular enough to allow for people to, to, to experiment with that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's really interesting to hear you talk about that and the, the expression of exciting the data sets, I, I found I find very nice kind of shaking it and tapping it and getting getting it to, 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 to resonate in different ways. Well, it used to be uh, like, there used to be an essential part of the performance um, that I kind of uh, ditched midway or, or shortly before uh, consolidating the final um, aesthetic uh, product. Um, so for a very uh, long time, I was uh, experimenting with a, a depth camera and I was um, sort of uh, performing movement gestures in front of the camera uh, to excite it in, and to, um, to spatialize it, um, uh, following my gestures in, in three dimensions. So this idea to excite the data set came from uh, that uh, came from those experiments because then I really felt like there is this uh, data set um, in front of me and I, I can almost like touch it uh, and uh, excite it with my hands. But then I, I kind of I couldn't really integrate this uh, with the rest of the uh, things going on in the piece aesthetically speaking. so, I took it out. It was a it was a good um, uh, experience to develop that uh, relationship with the camera and like uh, that basic tracking thing that I devised with it, but um, uh, it it was not um, meaningful for me enough to put it in the final thing. Mm -hmm. And nice. uh, going back to actually this this uh, question about the dimensional, it is. Uh, you know, when it comes to like, uh, you say like, we have like a certain number of dimensions or features that we can like perceive simultaneously. I, I sometimes feel like there is um, one or very little uh, that we can, or that I can do, uh, that I can uh, follow and trace simultaneously. Like if you if you listen to Bach fugue, uh, I, uh, at least the way I'm listening to Bach fugue, shall I say, is not that I can, um, you know, continuously equally divide my attention following different lines plus registering the harmonic grid, um, but rather I can uh, very quickly uh, recognize patterns uh, of like single uh, things. And my attention is, uh, as I'm getting better, I guess, in listening to Bach, if I listen to, that music a lot, my, attentions, my attention learns to hover uh, between the certain, between certain uh, areas of this texture and I can uh, recognize and connect things mentally faster and faster, but, but I'm still uh, in a way uh, mono. So I'm, I'm, I have one thing that I can um, focus on at, at one time is just, uh, it can appear, appear um, uh, polyphonic after a while because I'm switching so fast uh, the point of my attention um, uh, or, or sorry the target of my attention uh, but um, I, I wonder if it if it's not a similar case uh, when it comes to like observing uh, high dimensional data uh, relate or trying to perceive high dimensional data relationships by observing uh, uh, low dimensional projections of it. Um, it it's always like, um, uh, I, I feel like I can uh, focus on certain aspects and pick that up one by one, but uh, um, a feeling of uh, a holistic uh, understanding of this, um, uh, of the 
high di presumed time high dimensional space comes when I can switch my attention to many different patterns and recognize them uh, fast uh, in a sequence. But it's not like truly polyphonic then either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's an interesting way of looking at it. And it's right also to think about um, that not only are we creating these artifacts um, to engage with ourselves um, through performance or composition, but also uh, have to think about how these things are going to be perceived by the audience. So both you and Joe, Roma, for example, again, um, choose to, 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 to display these interfaces to the audience and, and, and have them engage with it um, in some way. And so, yeah, it's... Um, but I think it's 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 a complicated question that um, I think requires a kind of in, an in, an embodied knowledge of uh, you know having to really experience these things um, either through spectating or or getting your hands on some kind of interface and 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 really experiencing that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's a very um, rich and and promising avenue for future experimentation um one that i'm really looking forward to seeing how how that develops um so i'd like to move on to a few um broader questions um one thing that you've mentioned um kind of in passing and um that was kind that's been kind of uh mentioned between us sort of leading up to this um is uh is the question of kind of uh, technical um limitations so um i know that obviously due to some of the processing involved in this piece and the sheer amount of sounds that you're and and sounds and visuals that you're rendering onto the screen um that uh, you were having some difficulties uh, recording it getting a good recording um so i'd like to be in I'd, I'd be really interested to know um for this piece, but also in your practice in general, um, to what extent uh, you can be frustrated by technical limitations? Um, is this something that you constantly find yourself coming up against? Uh, do you embrace it as part of your work or do you try and work around it in, at all costs? Uh -huh. um, yes, uh, so I can get very frustrated um, uh, when uh, uh, I, I encounter some technical problems. I, I, I have to say, especially working with Jitter was a great source of frustration for me, probably because I'm a, a more or less first timer user of it. So I'm, uh, I'm of course familiar with the, with how it works, but um, you know, in Max, there are always this like uh, secret pathways to go if you want to ensure like best possible yield or performance or something and those things those like hidden tricks i i haven't really mastered yet uh, with jitter uh, so i i had a lot of um, performance issues that uh, didn't seem to uh, originate from my hardware like i could see that there is still a lot of headroom uh, in both like cpu and gpu but for some reason i get this like bottlenecks and that were sometimes really hard uh, and sometimes just impossible to track down. Um, so when when I encounter something like that, uh, I can get very frustrated, of course. Um, but there is always uh, a question, I think, when it comes to embracing this or rather avoiding this, uh, it's, I think, a question of virtuosity. You know, like uh, if uh, if I'm working on a in a studio uh, away from the audience, then I'm uh, then I'm I'm not trying to be virtuoso in our uh, in my uh, designs or in my uh, interaction of uh, the tools I use. It's um, um, I, I also have to say I, I'm typically not the fastest composer, so. I usually don't bother uh, uh, rushing through a composition. Um, uh, and uh, I even sometimes take uh, perhaps more time with some details than I should. Um, but then uh, I try to use uh, very straightforward, simple interfaces. And um, 
if there are technical complexities, um, I um, so for example, when it comes to like uh, developing a musical idea, uh, then I'm very motivated to get into a high level of complexity and uh, perhaps designing, uh, you know, some process in Max or um, doing whatever it takes uh, to make that happen. Um, when it comes to, um, I guess, uh, production quality, then I'm uh, a bit more conservative and just like to use uh, straightforward, uh, tried and tested or what I perceive as tried and tested ways and um, not trying to be too complex. In, in, instead, I'm trying to be as lightweight and straightforward as possible. That's, I guess, something that I uh, brought with me from my, um, uh, from my programmer uh, self because you know, in, uh, in programming, uh, the best uh, solutions are always the simplest ones. The ones that are achieving a goal in the most straightforward, lightweight and transparent uh, manner. Uh, few, fewest lines of code and et cetera. Um, the least amount of abstractions or branches or et cetera. So when it comes to production, I'm kind of following that mindset to be as efficient and uh, uh, lightweight and straightforward as possible. Uh, when it comes, but on the hand, on the other hand, when it comes to the hum or like a, a real-time live instrument, then uh, I of course embrace this idea that uh, I am a performer, so I want to be a virtuoso performer, and I. Um, I'm not shying away in a way from the from the challenge of um, either implementing a system like this or or practicing with it so I can um, perform with it uh, that, because that's uh, that's my way of uh, exercising my uh, myself as a virtuoso performer. I mean, in my perception. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting to hear about this, the, the transposition of traditional notions of virtuosity. So yeah, that are transposed onto new musical interfaces like a keyboard on a, com a computer keyboard or or in, in coding itself, you know, get um, making the most out of the instrument, your laptop, you know, getting around its technical limitations. There's obviously, yeah, a, a virtuosity to that. Um, and, and, you know, ways of doing things that, um, can be more elegant and beautiful than others and you know it's a, yeah it's a, it's a really interesting um concept um so yeah na naturally it was um important for you to get um a, a good quality recording um however um and i kind of touched on this um towards the beginning of our chat um i imagine that you know obviously the recording must Miss, miss some essential elements um, that are present when the piece is being divide, uh, diffused in, in a live space. Um, but that being said, um, from what I've seen, I, I believe there's there always seem to be um, recordings of your work online. So um, I was, I'm just curious uh, to learn, you know, how, how important um, things like spatialization in a live space are to you and, and how uh, a live version and a recorded version of a piece kind of exist together in the world and, and in your mind? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a complicated question. I'm, I'm not sure I have a, a ready answer for that, but um, if... Um... So if I uh, think about spatial sound, let's say, um, the, my problem with, uh, with it is that um, I, I, I don't usually create um, alternative stereo uh, renders and uh, uh, spatial audio renders of my uh, compositions because I liked to compose already with something very specific either to stereo or to spatial sound and if i let's say compose something for a spatial sound uh, spatial sound then i uh, so then the stereo will be at best uh, an okay projection of the um, of the real scene and it's never going to be an equivalent of it uh, which is uh, 
which is a problem that uh, often drives me nowadays to instead uh, work on uh, stereo pieces when it comes to creating fixed media compositions because um, it's um, when, when so there is this certain feeling of uh, you know swimming against current uh, when you're uh, composing a 3d audio piece because all the production techniques and software in the world are heavily biased towards stereo music production and uh, even if there are uh, miraculous software right like reaper existing it's still pretty hard to uh, disseminate your 3D audio works uh, if you want uh, a certain number of audience and, uh, you know, not just a few people that would fit in uh, under a dome or something. So that's, uh, that's, that's a problem I and my fellow composers here uh, in Oslo, who are, we are all working with spatial audio. I'm also sitting in a spatial audio studio here now. Um, we are all struggling with this and I don't think any one of us has a, a clear policy about this. Um, when, um, so uh, what was the other question? I'm sorry. Um, well, it's, um, uh, well, also kind of having these, uh, these kind of conceptual existences of the live performance and the recorded version of a oh, yeah. performance yeah. and how they maybe complement each other or how they exist. Yeah. So about that, I mean, especially in the case of the hum, uh, the live performance is overwhelmingly much better <laughs> to hear than this uh, recording. But uh, if you if you want to publish your piece on the internet, it's uh, it's you know two dimensions and stereo uh, and uh, uh, you know MP3 MP3 and MP4 and uh, OGG and maybe so that's your uh, space uh, where you can operate and uh, when it comes to uh, 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 interactive um, uh, 3D audio piece the, that's uh, of course uh, only a projection of the real thing and not the real thing. So um, I think uh, the biggest plus of uh, experiencing the hum live is that you can see me perform. So everything in your mind turns uh, into turns from uh, imagining it as like a pre-composed video work uh, into uh, this idea of like this happens uh, in the moment and. Uh, and with all the connotations uh, of that musical uh, musical connotations, um, the other thing uh, is a bit more. Uh, uh, it's simpler and more technical. Is that uh, I mentioned that all the uh, all the nodes you see on the uh, visualization or, or or in the visuals are directly mapped spatially to the sounds that you hear. So very often you, you hear a longer sequence starting on the screen, but as I hover forward, you will hear it sort of as we pass it by in the, in the speaker, uh, in the speaker ring. Um, and then uh, for every event, you can build up this intuitive underst understanding of where in the space we are now. So the whole thing, I think, becomes much more physical, uh, and that you completely lose in the in the internet dissemination because then you get a, a binaural uh, or uh, some kind of fancy USJ stereo or uh, you know some kind of uh, dual channel projection uh, in whatever fancy way you choose. Um, and then uh, that's it. Uh, it's like dimensional reduction. You you uh, get a projection of the thing, which hopefully preserves the most important parts of it. But a lot of the finer details will get lost. Uh, and uh, for that, uh, I, I treat uh, uh, the internet as like a platform where I can... Uh, in a way, advertise that the piece exists and uh, and and uh, I can perform it. Uh, but that's why I, I chose not to disclose the full performance on the internet because I feel 
then it it would really turn into a video work. Uh, mm. And then if it's a video work, then there are certain things that have to work differently uh, because yeah. you know, a, a good uh, a good album is not just a recording of a concert. Although in some cases, in some rare cases, it can be. But um, most of the cases, making an album or making a video work is a completely different ball game than than playing live and perform live. And then mm -hmm. I just made a, a teaser for this that should hopefully facilitate some um, interest uh, in the live performance, but uh, not. Uh, but but I don't think I will disclose the the, the whole thing, the whole performance online. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and case in point, you know, so I, would, so I was lucky enough to to have been shared privately a, a, a recording and, and some of the ideas that I'd formulated about how, how, especially about how the piece worked and how things were being triggered and stuff were, was wrong. It was, uh, which obviously if you, if you're there in the space, then you, then yeah, we'll see you as a performer <clears throat> performing this thing and, and you, you experience the, the whole piece completely differently, obviously, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so hopefully uh, one day I'll be able to make the trip to, to Oslo or you'll be able to tour this around uh, some a bit further west in Europe uh, towards uh, France or Huddersfield uh, and I'll be able to, to experience it um, uh, as it really should be experienced. Um, that's great. Uh, I had a few final questions, um, sort of moving a bit um, away from the piece now and more to to the kind of um to the sort of flucoma ecosystem that i'd love to get your take on um so you were talking earlier about um that that idea of uh in max or in in any framework in any kind of creative coding environment or any coding environment uh, those kind of tricks and sort of things that you kind of get to know through using it and through going through forum posts and stuff and kind of getting to know how to use a, 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 a certain platform. Um, I, I'd, I'd just be really interested in hearing about your experience um, learning the tools. So um, so you've been um, quite active on the on the um, on the forum, you you attended the workshop in, in Oslo, um, and you've also been helping other people out and sort of sharing your programming experience in the comments. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to learn how, um, how you experience sort of entering into the, to the Flucoma workflow uh, ecosystem, which has been quite kind of purposefully uh, thought about to try and make it as, encompassing and welcoming as possible um and you know just uh, how you've if you've uh, felt that it's been able to to helpfully expand your workflow as an artist oh yeah i uh i feel like uh i mean in this sense i'm i'm very biased uh i uh have been in this um like a locked group of uh, early testers uh, of sukuma and uh I have seen it evolve, and uh, in that sense, I also develop some uh, emotional relationship to the project. So I, I, I don't think I can talk objectively about it. Uh, but uh, my take is that, uh, uh, like, uh, it's really uh, something to uh, use the platform of Max for to be able to uh, work with uh, with the Fukuma toolbox. And luckily enough, actually, you don't really need Max for this. You, you can do it in Super Collider, in PD, in the CLI, and uh, where else? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, but so that that's also a really fascinating aspect because um, I, have a, I have a friend here uh, or several friends actually whom we are uh, constantly um, uh, sharing ideas with, uh, musical ideas, uh, more music tech ideas. Uh, but it, there has always been a certain level of separation between us because uh, I'm always using Max for my developments and they are always using Super Collider for their development. And uh, up until very recently, there was no real bridge for us to like uh, like practically functionally share ideas it was always we we could only talk uh, about things in a broad way 
Mm -hmm. And uh, with Flukoma, uh, in which uh, all of us got really interested, we finally have this uh, idea, we, we finally have this bridge to converse about creative coding and uh, uh, just the creative process of uh, working with uh, our materials. And that's, that's great. I, I never really uh, experienced that before Flukoma. I think that's the, that's the biggest uh, beauty of it. The other thing I really like about Flukoma is that uh, it's, um, it's uh, intentionally made into a very granular thing. So, you know, if you want Flukoma, you don't need all Flukoma. You just can, you know, if you, if you want to, uh, uh, accomplish one particular goal there might be uh, one particular object that you need and then you never really have to look uh, towards uh, the other objects let's say uh, you're not e not really interested in the whole uh, small data big data uh, thing uh, or data driven composition you just really wanted to have a nice buffer composition tool there you go. You just uh, grab the buff compose and uh, you can do a lot of things with only that object. Um, um, and there, there, uh, I feel like uh, in the design, there were always this thought, there was always this thought that each object should stand uh, on its own and should be able to fulfill a purpose. And uh, of course, uh, as you, uh, get more and more into this genre of data-driven composition or sonification or whatever, uh, then uh, you more and more um, discover the synergy between the objects. And uh, I guess recently the synergy uh, got more and more emphasized with this, um, with this new breaking change of uh, Flukoma that now you can speed patch it. Um, which is really good. It really emphasizes the synergy between the different objects, which was, which was perhaps a little bit more rigid earlier. Um, not to say that that was, um, uh, I think, I don't think that was a factor that stopped people using it, but it's certainly a nice touch from the developers that they thought about the um, quality of life sort of, of from a developer perspective and mm -hmm. uh, and they really implemented uh, changes that would uh, get you going uh, very fast and and uh, it's not i guess it's not just a quality of life uh, improvement it's it's also um, freeing up your thoughts a little bit from uh, bookkeeping and uh, just managing simple practical things instead you can really like you are allowed not to lose your um, uh, train of thought and just uh, quickly speed speed patch uh, through until you get what you want. That's that's really great. Mm. Um, I also really like the idea about uh, Flukoma that uh, it uh, groups uh, the objects into different categories. So there are slicers, there are descriptors, there are uh, uh, decomposers <laughs> or, uh, or um, uh, certain kind of uh, audio processes that you would use to like filter or separate or, or decompose the sound in some way. Um, I, I, I also think that, um, so, so what I, I'm, I'm trying to say so many things at once. Uh, the final thing I guess I should say is that it's really good that uh, they thought about uh, real-time and non-real-time uh, execution and that um, uh, all of the tools, or I think almost all of them, uh, can work in their own threads. So you are not limited to... Um, to one uh, CPU core, or you're not limited to the current thread that you're working with. That's also very pleasant because often you have to perform analysis over a large corpus, uh, which doesn't happen instantaneously. And then it's very nice that you don't uh, have to uh, sort of freeze everything and wait, but you can just start things going and then move on to do other things while that's happening. Uh, that's, that's really awesome as well.
Mm. Yeah, and, and so of course the the breaking changes that you were referring to there, the the uh, the beta beta seven update, where uh, yeah, um, the main change being that uh, you no longer have to supply um, manually supplied buffers, um, which was I think that was uh, quite. I mean, yeah, as you say, it wasn't something that necessarily stopped people from using it, but um, that was one of the bigger rubbing points for, for some people using buffers in that way. Um, it wasn't partic a particularly intuitive way of doing things, although you, you do get used to it. And, and I think I, I still tend to, to supply the buffers manually anyway now, but, uh, but uh, yeah, no, that was a it's interesting change. And uh, yeah, no, it was also interesting that first point you raised about um, the, the different communities and particularly those three um, Max Super Collider and Pure Data communities, which, uh, you know, obviously having different communities with their own kind of ways of doing things and tropes and stuff is, is a great thing, but it's, it is also sometimes there are, you know, divides between people that are, you know, essentially all in, interested in the same kinds of things. And, it, and it's great to hear that um, flucoma can be something that um, bring, brings uh, people from those different communities together. Um, so maybe as a last question, um, I know that you've given um, various masterclasses and workshops in composition and music tech, um, which may have predated um, some of the work that you did using the Flucome tools and things. Um, but I thought it might be interesting just to finish on hearing um, uh, what, uh, what would you describe as being kind of essential skills in your workflow uh, for composition using music tech and, and how do you approach uh, teaching things like composition to people? Uh, well, uh, first of all, a disclaimer: I, I never taught uh, composition. I, right. I, okay. You, I, I usually teach the technicalities that mm -hmm. uh, come with composition, <laughs> but not composition itself. I don't know how I would teach that. To be honest, uh, uh, I don't really have a methodology. We we often teach each other with our friends. Uh, so when we show uh, uh, working progress uh, piece uh, to each other we often uh, you know give each other ideas uh, what to try what uh, what might be problematic etc but i think uh, i i always feel like that can only work this way that uh, since we are longtime friends there is this level of trust between us that uh, allows us to um, you know, uh, make uh, those kind of comments or like very specific uh, um, um, ideas, and uh, and also that uh, we are both uh, talking on, on the same level. It's not uh, a teacher talking uh, to a student, um, which doesn't necessarily have to be a vertical orientation. Uh, um, and it's just a um, um, I guess uh, the student teacher relationship is still not the same as just uh, two friends or several friends. Uh, so uh, if I uh, would ever teach composition, I would wish to uh, teach like that or uh, teach and get thought, uh, get taught uh, by that, uh, by, by a community of uh, like-minded people. But uh, when it comes to uh, teaching, um, I think um, uh, so. I I always uh, come to teaching um, by trying to roll back to the past where I was a, a classical music composer who was pretty much illiterate in technology, and uh, I I when I showcase a concept in Max, for example, when I teach Max. Uh, I try to remember how I felt uh, when I didn't know about that thing or when I didn't understand that concept. Uh, and uh, I try to give visual examples. Of course, that's, that's always useful to create like interactive visual, audiovisual examples. But I'm also uh, trying to think back and in a way teach my past self of uh, 
um, discovering that thing uh, the, uh, or understanding like truly the nature of uh, like some of these concepts. Uh, uh, that usually helps. That that usually puts me in a perspective where I can understand what and why a person doesn't understand because uh, I can uh, remember myself uh, not understanding it uh, a few years ago. Um, I guess that's the most uh, most important thing about it. But uh, while we are talking about this, I I also. Uh, wanted to uh, say or wanted to point out in the last question uh, that uh, the documentation of flucoma is just so astonishingly outstanding uh, compared to many other uh, commonly used libraries uh, that you use in creative composition that uh, I think that itself uh, can be, a, uh, that, that alone uh, can be a reason to get into Flucoma because even if you don't end up using the tools, uh, the, some of the concepts uh, are so well and beautifully um, explained by the help patches, by the online Learn Flucoma platform. It's, it's uh, really amazing how much uh, effort the development team poured into um, uh, helping people to pick it up in a way. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, it's certainly been, yeah, from, from the beginning, that was consciously something that was very important uh, to the tech team. And that, um, that's been a large part of mine, especially James Bradbury and, and Ted Moore's jobs um, over the past year. Um, and uh, yeah, they'll be very happy to hear that um, that that, uh, that whole kind of learn ecosystem that we've been building up is, 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 uh, is doing the job and uh, it's been well received. Um, yeah, great. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, Valent, thank you so much. Um, it was really fascinating. It's quite frustrating to uh, know that um, I'm not going to be able to experience the piece um, as it really should be um, for the foreseeable future, but maybe that or maybe that or uh, change soon. But um, no, it's been really, really interesting to hear how, how you've been working with the tools um, and to hear about your practice. And uh, yeah, no, I'm really, really looking forward to seeing what's going to be coming next and how how you'll be be taking these uh, these ideas um, into the future. So, Valen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you so much uh, for asking me to do this um, podcast. I'll also, thank uh, thank you for your enormous uh, otherworldly patience with me, uh, because I have been putting you off for quite a while and uh, uh, postponing uh, it. And thank you for the great questions and the wonderful conversation. And uh, I'm happy to be part of the community. So hopefully um, we'll see each other uh, sometime soon. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you a lot. I'll see you, speak to you again soon. Have a nice evening. Cheers. Bye.